Hello. Today we're going to finish our discussion on diagonalizability. First, let's review some concepts from before. Recall that a linear transformation T is said to be diagonalizable if there exists an ordered basis beta, such that the matrix representation of T with respect to beta is a diagonal matrix. That is, if V sub J are the vectors from our basis beta, then T applied to V sub J is a scalar lambda j times v sub j. A square matrix A is said to be diagonalizable if the left multiplication by a linear transformation is a diagonalizable transformation. Here's our big theorem. Let's say that T is a linear transformation between a vector space V and itself. Let's assume first that T has k distinct eigenvalues where k is less than or equal to n. If a set S that consists of non-zero vectors v sub j says that t of v sub j is lambda j times v sub j, then S is a linearly independent set. Moreover, if t has n distinct eigenvalues, then t is a diagonalizable linear transformation. We give a couple of remarks. If t has n distinct eigenvalues, then the collection of eigenvectors is a basis. We show this example of the reflection about a line y equals mx. We found two distinct eigenvalues, namely plus 1 and minus 1, and hence we found two eigenvectors. Those two eigenvectors, v1 and v2, form a basis for the real plane R2. However, if t has k distinct eigenvalues where k is strictly less than n, then t may still be diagonalizable, and its eigenvectors may still form a basis. For example, let's consider the identity map i sub v that just takes a vector v to itself. We found before that this has just k equals 1 eigenvalue, namely lambda equals 1. However, we still found that this has two eigenvectors, that is, the standard basis vectors e sub 1 and e sub 2. Hence, this linear transformation, i sub v, is diagonalizable. In order to really determine whether a linear transformation is diagonalizable, today we're going to introduce the concept of multiplicity. Let's say that v is an n-dimensional vector space with the basis beta. Let's let T be a linear transformation from V to itself, and let's denote A as the matrix representation of T with respect to beta. Let's assume that T has K distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda sub K. Then our characteristic polynomial F of T factors in a certain way. For example, it'll look like plus or minus 1 times T minus lambda 1 to some power M1 times t minus lambda sub k to some power m sub k. The exponents m1, m2 through m sub k are called the multiplicities of the corresponding eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2 through lambda sub k. Observe that the sum of the multiplicities must be the dimension of the vector space. That is because the number of factors that we have, namely m1 plus m2 plus m sub k, must be the degree of the polynomial, which of course is equal to the dimension of the space V. Recall that if lambda is an eigenvalue for T, then we know that there exists a non-zero vector, lowercase v, contained in the null space of the linear transformation T minus lambda IV. This set, this null space, we'll call E sub lambda and we'll call this the eigenspace of t corresponding to lambda. We're going to focus quite a bit on this eigenspace today. Let's begin by discussing a few examples. Let's say that we have a linear transformation L sub a in terms of the following 2 by 2 matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1. We found before that its characteristic polynomial is t minus 1 squared. Hence, by looking at the factorization of the characteristic polynomial, we see that there is a unique eigenvalue, lambda 1 equals 1, 
and it has multiplicity m sub 1 equals 2. Again, recall that the multiplicity is the exponent that we have here. We can now compute the eigenspace with respect to this eigenvalue, lambda sub 1 equals 1. By definition, this is the set of vectors such that L sub A of V equals lambda 1 times V. However, if V is the vector x, y, then L sub A of V is just the vector x, y again. Lambda 1 is equal to 1, so lambda 1 times V is also equal to x, y. So the expression L sub A of V equals lambda 1 times V is equivalent to the two equations x equals x and y equals y. But every vector, x comma y, satisfies these two equations. So we see that the eigenspace is just the span of our two vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Recall that 1, 0, 0, 1 just forms the standard basis for F2. So in this case, the eigenspace E sub lambda 1 has dimension 2. Therefore, the dimension of the eigenspace is equal to the multiplicity. Let's observe for now that this matrix A is a diagonalizable matrix. As another example, let's consider the linear transformation coming from the 2 by 2 matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. We've also found that its characteristic polynomial is again t minus 1 squared. Hence, this matrix has unique eigenvalue lambda 1 equals 1, and again, its multiplicity is m1 equals 2. The multiplicity is the exponent that we see for our factor. The eigenspace in this case is a little bit different. Again, the eigenspace consists of those vectors v, such that L sub a of v equals lambda 1 times v. However, if v is the vector x comma y, then L sub a of v is the vector x plus y comma y. So the eigenspace in this case consists of the set of solutions to the two equations x plus y equals x and y equals y. The second equation, y equals y, really doesn't have any conditions, so let's consider the first equation x plus y equals x. Upon subtracting x from both sides, we see that really these two sets of equations correspond to just one equation, namely y equals 0. But of course, since x can be anything, we see that this eigenspace is spanned by the vector 1, 0. Hence, the dimension of this eigenspace is just 1, which is different from the multiplicity m sub 1 equals 2. Let's observe for now that this matrix A is not a diagonalizable matrix. We'll see why a little bit later. Let's consider another example. Consider now the following 3 by 3 matrix 3, 1, 0, 0, 3, 4, 0, 0, 4. Since this is an upper triangular matrix, we actually find that the characteristic polynomial is negative 1 times t minus 3 squared times t minus 4. You'll notice that the eigenvalues are lambda 1 equals 3 and lambda 2 equals 4. In fact, lambda 1 equals 3 has multiplicity m1 equals 2, and lambda 2 equals 4 has multiplicity m sub 2 equals 1. Let's consider the eigenspace for the first eigenvalue, lambda sub 1 equals 3. Again, remember that the eigenspace consists of those vectors v, such that L sub a of v equals lambda 1 times v. Well, L sub a of v we have as 3x plus y, 3y plus 4z, and 4z. Lambda 1 times y would just be, lambda 1 times v would just be 3x, 3y, and 3z as a vector. This means that we have three equations, three unknowns, and we can try our best to solve for x, y, and z. From the third equation, 4z equals 3z, we see that z must be 0. From the second equation, since z must be 0, we really don't find any conditions on y. We just have the truism 3y equals 3y. But in the first equation, we have 3x plus y equals 3x. Upon subtracting 3x from both sides, 
we see that y must be 0. So our eigenspace really consists of the set of solutions to just two equations, y equals 0 and z equals 0. But x can be anything. So this means that the eigenspace is the span of the one vector 1, 0, 0. You see now that the dimension of this eigenspace must be 1, and 1 is different from the multiplicity, m sub 1, which equals 2. Now, let's try to work out the same exact properties for the next eigenspace for lambda 2 equals 4. For this second eigenvalue, again, we'd like to take a look at la of v equals lambda 2 times v, but now lambda 2 times v corresponds to the vector 4x, 4y, and 4z. Upon working through, we find that z is arbitrary, but y must equal 4z, and x must equal 4z. This means that the eigenspace in this case corresponds to the span of the vector 4, 4, 1. But we see that the dimension now of this eigenspace is 1, which does equal to the multiplicity m sub 2, which also equals 1. Let's use these examples to try to write down a more general property. Recall that the eigenspace of a linear transformation t corresponding to a scalar lambda is that subspace E sub lambda, which consists of the vectors lowercase v, since the t of lowercase v is lambda times lowercase v. Let's assume that t is a linear transformation and that it has k distinct eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda sub k. We'll denote m sub i as the multiplicity of the eigenvalue lambda sub i. First, the dimension of each eigenspace, e sub lambda i, is between 1 and m sub i. That is, the dimension is at least 1 and is at most the multiplicity m sub i. Second, the intersection of the eigenspaces, e sub lambda i, with e sub lambda j, is just the zero vector. That is, these two eigenspaces always intersect in only one point, namely the origin. Third, let's say that S sub i is a linearly independent subset of the eigenspace E sub lambda i. Then the union over these independent subsets is also a linearly independent subset of V. Finally, T is diagonalizable if and only if the dimension of each eigenspace is equal to M sub i. That is, the dimension must be as large as possible for each eigenvalue, lambda sub i. Indeed, if t is diagonalizable, then let's let beta be the union over the bases beta sub i of each subspace e sub lambda i. Then beta is an ordered basis consisting of eigenvectors for our linear transformation, t. Let's see an example of this. Let's consider our linear transformation from before corresponding to the 3 by 3 matrix 3, 1, 0, 0, 3, 4, 0, 0, 4. We found before that the two eigenvalues are lambda 1 equals 3 and lambda 2 equals 4. And in fact, by factoring the characteristic polynomial and looking at the exponents, we see that the multiplicity of lambda 1, namely m sub 1, equals 2, and the multiplicity of lambda sub 2, namely m sub 2, equals 1. We also found that the eigenspaces e sub lambda 1 and e sub lambda 2 are span in terms of just one vector. e sub lambda 1 is the span of a set s sub 1, and e sub lambda 2 is the span of a set s sub 2. We'll denote s as the union of these two. First, these eigenspaces are just lines, that is that they are the span of one vector, so they move in just one direction. These lines intersect at the origin, that is e sub lambda 1 intersect e sub lambda 2 is the origin in R3 space. Next, the sets S1, S2, and the union, capital S, are linearly independent sets. Third, the dimension of e sub lambda 1 equals 1, 
and the dimension of e sub lambda 2 also equals 1. However, 1 does not equal to m sub 1, so we actually see that a must not be diagonalizable. Remember that the theorem says that a matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if the dimensions of each of the eigenspaces is as large as possible. Indeed, the dimension of the eigenspace for lambda 1 is equal to 1, not equal to 2. Let's skim over the proofs of the statements in the theorem. To begin, we'll prove the first statement, so assume that lambda is an eigenvalue of t with multiplicity m. We know that the eigenspace is the null space of a transformation t minus lambda iv, and the null space is always the subspace of a vector space. Since lambda is an eigenvalue, then we know that there must be an eigenvector. That is, that there exists a non-zero vector v sub 1, since the t of v sub 1 equals lambda v sub 1. So e sub lambda must be the non-trivial vector space. Hence, its dimension is greater than or equal to 1. Let's say that D is the dimension of this eigenspace, and let's choose an ordered basis for our eigenspace. We know that we can extend this to an ordered basis for the entire vector space V. By looking at the action of our linear transformation on this basis beta, then we realize that the matrix representation is a matrix in a very special form. Namely, by looking at the first D columns of our matrix, we find an identity matrix where essentially along the diagonal we just have our eigenvalue lambda. The rest of the matrix isn't really of that much important to us. But we will say that the characteristic polynomial factors as T minus lambda to the D times the determinant of some smaller N minus D by N minus D matrix. Notice that this means that t minus lambda to the d is a power of t minus lambda that divides the characteristic polynomial. However, from the way that we've set up the multiplicity, t minus lambda to the m is the largest power of t minus lambda that divides this characteristic polynomial. And so, since t minus lambda to the d must divide t minus lambda to the m, we see that d must be less than or equal to m. Let's now focus on the second statement. We want to say how the intersection of the two distinct eigenspaces is just the origin. First, observe that the zero vector is always an element of any subspace. So in particular, it must be in the intersection. This means that the singleton set consisting of just the zero vector is contained in the intersection. In the other direction, let's say that V is any vector that is in the intersection. We'll just use a couple of clever identities to show that V here must be the zero vector. Indeed, if we use the fact that lambda i minus lambda j divided by lambda i minus lambda j is just equal to 1, then we'll write the number 1 in a very clever way so that V equals a scalar times V minus another scalar times V. However, lambda i times v is just t of v i because, by our choice, v i is an element of the eigenspace corresponding to lambda i. Similarly, lambda j times v is t of v because v is also an element of the eigenspace corresponding to lambda j. But now, staring at what we've written here on the screen, we see we have a scalar times t of v minus the same scalar times t of v. So this here must be the zero vector. But now this shows that the intersection must be contained in this singleton set. Hence, we must have equality. Now let's show the third statement. Let's say that perhaps S sub i is a linearly independent subset of the eigenspace E sub lambda i, and this consists of N sub i vectors. Now we can consider the union over all of these, this is our set capital S, and we can write this in terms of vectors v sub ij, where of course i runs from 1 to k, this corresponds to the linearly independent subsets S sub i, and j runs from 1 through n sub i. Remember that each linearly independent subset S sub i has n sub i vectors. 
In order to show that this union is a linearly independent subset, let's consider a linear combination that adds up to the zero vector. So we'd like to have a sum over the v sub i j's times some scalars a sub i j. Of course, we want to prove that each of the scalars a sub i j must be the zero scalar. Now, if we have a sum here where we range over i going from 1 to k and j going from 1 to n sub i, let's collect the sum over j and write this as w sub i. Again, w sub i is the sum as j goes from 1 through n sub i, a i j times v i j. By the way we set things up, this linear combination is a linear combination of elements from s sub i. Hence, w sub i must be an element of the eigenspace e sub lambda i. Now, upon applying, applying t to each v w sub i, remember that w sub i is an element of the eigenspace e sub lambda i. So by definition, t applied to anything from this eigenspace must be lambda i times the original vector. So this actually means that w sub i must be a vector such that t of w i equals lambda i w i. Let's denote S prime as the collection of those W sub i's that are not the zero vector. Then we've just got finished showing that S sub i must, S prime must be a linearly independent set. But now if we have a sum of the W i's equals the zero vector, then we actually find a contradiction because again, w S prime must be a linearly independent set. So this means that each w sub i must be the zero vector. But if this is the case, remember that w sub i is a sum, j goes from 1 to n sub i, of a i j v to j. But as we mentioned before, this is a sum over the elements of s sub i. s sub i is a linearly independent set. So the only way we can have the sum equals the zero vector is if each of the scalars a sub i j is the zero scalar. So we do conclude that R set S, the union of the S sub i's, must be a linearly independent set as well. We now prove the final statement. We want to show that T is diagonalizable if and only if the dimension of each E sub lambda i equals M sub i. Now we know that T is diagonalizable if and only if there exists a basis beta consisting of eigenvectors. So we will prove that such a basis exists if and only if the dimension of E sub lambda i equals M sub i. Let's prove one direction. Let's assume that there does exist a basis beta consisting of eigenvectors. We will prove that the dimension of each E sub lambda i equals m sub i. Now, to begin with, the dimension of e sub lambda i is less than or equal to m sub i. That was the very first statement that we proved. Now, if we sum over the differences m i minus the dimension of e lambda i, this is a sum over positive elements. So the sum must be positive. However, by using associativity, the sum of the m sub i must be the size of our basis beta. Again, remember that the sum of the m sub i's must be equal to n. n is the dimension of our space, but we're assuming that beta is a basis. So the number of elements in beta must be n. On the other hand, the dimension of e lambda i must be greater than or equal to beta sub i, where beta sub i is just the number of elements in the basis beta that happen to be in E sub lambda i. But beta sub i is a linearly independent subset sitting inside of a vector space. So the number of elements in this linearly independent subset must be less than or equal to the dimension of the subspace. So staring at this, we see that the number of elements in beta minus the sum of the elements in the beta sub i must be greater than or equal to zero but we also know that this is equal to zero because of course beta is now going to be a union over the beta sub i's. But because zero equals zero, we now see that the dimension of e sub lambda i must be equal to m sub i. 
Let's now go in the opposite direction. Let's assume that the dimension of e sub lambda i is equal to m sub i. We're going to prove that we do have a basis consisting of eigenvectors for t. Let's let beta sub i be an ordered basis for each e sub lambda i. Well, we know that the intersection of beta i and beta j must be the empty set because the intersection lies in the intersection of the eigenspaces, but the intersection of the eigenspaces just consists of one vector, namely the zero vector. However, the zero vector cannot be in these linearly independent sets, so we see that the intersection must be empty. In particular, every vector from beta sub i must be an eigenvector of t because remember that if it is contained inside of the eigenspace e lambda i, then by definition, t of v equals lambda i times v. And we know that our beta sub i is a basis, so it cannot contain the zero vector. Let's now denote beta as the union over each of these ordered bases for e lambda i. We know now that beta here must be a linearly independent subset of the vector space v. So we just have to show that beta here now is a basis for v. But to do this, we just simply observe that the number of elements in beta must be equal to the dimension of the space. This means that we have a linearly independent subset that consists of eigenvectors, says that the number of vectors is the dimension of the space. So that means that this beta here must be the basis that we desired. This completes the proof. Thanks very much for watching.